Our next speaker is Anzi Karyain, and I hope I pronounced the last name correctly. He's uh, one of uh, the, he's a part of the Django team and wrote a huge part of the ORM. And now is, he's going to talk to us today about how we lose all our customers' money, uh, sorry, how we not lose our customers' money. So. So hello, I'm, my name is Hansi Kahre and I'm here to talk about using Django in a banking setup and of course about uh, making uh, uh, reliable banking with Django. Uh, first a bit about me, so uh, I work at Holovi as a backend lead. I've been working over there for a couple of years. I enjoy it a lot. Uh, I'm also has be, have been doing some ORM work, so uh, from 2012, I have been Django Core contributor, worked on the ORM a lot until a couple of years ago. Uh, now I have a couple of small kids, so that's taking all of my time, but I'm hoping to get back to Django at some point. So, first a quick introduction to what Holovi does. So, we offer business banking services to micro-entrepreneurs in F Finland, Germany, Austria, and to e-residents of Est Estonia. Uh, the e-residents is uh, actually a pretty fun setup. So, anywhere in the world, you can uh, go to Estonian embassy, register as an uh, e-Estonian, and then you can set up banking, you can set up a business uh, like you were a real Estonian uh, uh, origin and that way you can, without ever visiting Estonia, you can actually set up a business in Europe. Uh, Holvi, does, uh, uh, Holvi has a payments account, so it's very much like a banking, uh, a bank account, except for legal reasons, it's kind of different, but for practical purposes, it's, uh, it offers you SEPA payments, it offers you MasterCard, it offers you online payments which you can use with the whole way online shop. On top of the bank account, we have, a, uh, we have some business tools. So we have invoicing, you can create invoices, send them to somebody, uh, collect money, so you get the SEPA transfer in. We automatically match the payment to the invoice, we do the bookkeeping for you. Uh, we have an online shop, so you can uh, sell stuff online. It's, it's for small shops, but it's really quick to set up, so it takes a uh, couple of minutes to start selling something online. Uh, again, you get the money immediately when somebody pay, uh, buys something from you, you get the money immediately on your account, and we do the bookkeeping, all of that for you. Uh, finally, we have expense handling, so when you're traveling, you can go to somewhere with taxi, uh, use your MasterCard, you get a push notification when you paid, so, uh, you can do the bookkeeping easily on the go. You take the picture of the receipt, you do the categorization, so the VAT stuff. So you get the bookkeeping preparation done uh, real time. So that is what Holby does. It's an interesting offering. Try it out if you are in one of the markets or, well, if you want to be an e Estonian. Uh, our tech stack, nothing more special going on in there, but I'll go through it in any case. So you understand what we are using on the backend side. So we have Django, of course. And then we have Django REST framework uh, using PostgreSQL. Then we have Celery for asynchronous tasks for uh, doing these scheduled tasks using Redis behind that. Uh, we have Angular on the front end side. I don't know that much about it, uh, but it works really well for us. Uh, we have then. Uh, native mobile apps, we have iOS, Android, uh, and finally, we are running all of this on Amazon, so we use S3, we use the EC2, we use uh, a lot of services, RDS, for example, from Amazon, and it's, it's working really for, well for us. Django, for us, has been a good choice. Uh, the ecosystem is really nice. For pretty much every, anything you want to do, you find something already uh, existing. So that's a big plus when using Django. It's, it's an overstatement to say that it's easy to find developers, but there are a lot of developers using Django. At the moment in Finland, of course, you know, anybody who has seen a computer is immediately hired, so, so it's kind of a, 
not that easy to find the developers, but at least there are a lot of developers who know the Django. And finally, it's reliable. It's a uh, proven software. It works really well for banking setup. We are using Django for 99% of uh, the code we have. So, and it, it works really well. It's reliable. It's uh, as all of the basic things you need for building something uh, for banking. So my subtopic for today is that how not to lose your customers' money. There are two options. The first option, which we try to use, is reliable payments. You don't lose the payments. Uh, you always get them go through the system, and everybody's happy. But in case there's an error somewhere, you lose a message, you, you have a bug somewhere, it's not that you lose your customers' money. You actually lose your own money. You, you need to use a lot of time for each error case to solve it out that, hey, is this really an error case? Uh, what's happening in the system? Where is the money? And in the worst case, you, for example, can double execute a payment. You send 1,000 euros two times to somewhere, and it's often impossible to get the money back. So there it went. You lost your own money. But you actually don't ever, ever lose your customers' money because... That's the way banks work. You, you take the losses for yourself instead of uh, anything going for the customers. So I'm quickly going to introduce the play payment flow. Uh, so just to have the mindset for how, how this th thing works in Holloway. This is a bit simplified, but it, it has all the major pieces in there. So it starts with customer verifying a payment, typing in the IBAN and stuff like that. Uh, then they receive a push notification with a security token, so we do two-factor authentication with that. They type it in, uh, click verify, the payment goes out. Then actually starts the uh, kind of the payment processing inside Holovi. So first we make a message, we, we record this in the, the kind of the front-end side, or well, the customer-facing side of the uh, back-end, and then we send a message to core accounting, the next layer, uh, which handles actually the, all of the money. We want to keep that uh, at least conceptu uh, conceptually separate from the uh, customer-facing features for security, for performance, for... Uh, you can change the customer-facing features quickly, but you want to keep the uh, core accounting such that you don't change it too often. Then for core accounting, we send a message to approvals. This is something that was kind of a surprise for me, that actually the approvals, how do you verify that this payment is okay? That's, uh, that's causing a lot of the issues when you are uh, trying to build a banking setup. So you have a lot of compliance rules from the law, for example, that you don't send money to uh, terrorists, you don't send money for money laundering purposes, and then you, of course, need to handle your own risk. So you check that, uh, is everything okay with the payment? Uh, from kind of, is, is somebody trying to empty the account illegally? Uh, then, okay, somehow we approve the payment uh, by some machine learning approach or manually. We get an, an other message for, uh, to core accounting that, okay, this money is now okay to move out of the side of Holloway. Then you get the message to Bank Gateway. Bank Gateway is a system we use for uh, interacting the external banking world. The external banking world, in many cases, is based on technologies from 80s. It's very much batch-based. So in the Bank Gateway, we take all of the payments and build a batch of those, send an XML somewhere outside of our system. But inside Holovi, everything is message-based, everything is real-time, but when it gets to the uh, external banking, then it turns to a, into a batch. Into the other direction, it's pretty much the same setup. So now you get the batch from external banking, then you get the payment message to core accounting from your bank gateway. Uh, you do the approvals, couple of messaging go, going over in there. Then you get the uh, message to the business tool, so the uh, uh, customer-facing backend, where we do the, all of the bookkeeping and uh, stuff like that, and finally you try to automate the bookkeeping, and or depending on the case, you send a notification to the customer, hey, now you receive 100 euros of money. So, the reliability in this case. For a startup, you might have 100 payments a day. It's 
low amount. At this point, you probably have a kind of a simple system still, so you just use a couple of messages. You don't do the approvals by having a separate system somewhere, but you do uh, it maybe by just using a Django admin and checking that hey, it, it seems OK. Your reliability might, uh, reliability might not be that high, three nines. So one in 1,000 uh, messages of these two messages is lost. This means that you get one case a week. It's fine. That's easily doable by hand, so no problem in that case. Uh, actually, an interesting story about Holby. In the beginning, very beginning of Holby, the system worked such that when, when the user typed a uh, payment out, they filled the form, clicked, OK, pay this. What happened in the back end was that somebody copied the data from Django admin to an external bank by hand, and it worked for the very beginning of Holby. So kind of getting back to the sophistication we had in the uh, morning by uh, Daniel. So if you are a startup, you can do something very unsophisticated, and it works really well for, for the beginning. So you can prove the concept and then start improving it. Now, all of this now in the mid-sized phase, uh, these numbers are not real numbers from all of it. We have a bit different numbers, but uh, this kind of reflects what we have in Holby. So 10,000 payments a day, five messages per payment. So now, as you saw, the flows, the messaging amounts are now a bit higher. We have the approval system, we have the uh, back end, or, or the uh, customer facing back end, we have the core accounting back end talking with each other. Uh, the reliability has gone up a bit, so you lose one message out of 10,000. This means that you get, on average, five cases a day. And if it takes you a couple of hours, if you haven't automated uh, resolving the payments, if it takes a couple of hours per payment, failed payment, you need now a dedicated person, maybe even two dedicated persons, to solve out these payments. And it's really not cost effective. So at this point, you want to start to have reliability, and we are now building the reliability for the messaging. Uh, finally, on the enterprise level, just as an example, if you get a million payments a day, 10 messages per payment, so now you are making it more microservice uh, style. You have improved your reliability, you have invested a lot on your architecture, kind of the hardware, and now you have uh, five nines reliability, which is really good, but you still get 100 cases a day, which means that you have a de department of solving these cases. So when you scale up, you want to build more reliability into your system. So uh, the thing that I see very often is that people build these systems, microservices or otherwise systems where you have messaging, but they don't build the reliability into the messaging. That's fine if you don't have that many messages or if it's fine to lose some messages. So if you, for example, the push notification we send to the customers, it's fine to lose one in 10,000. It's not a problem at all. But the payment messages, each time we lose it, pretty much each time we will get a call from the customer that, hey, now my money is missing, do something. And we get to do the work or we get to pay the money. So we want to build the messaging reliable. So the idea we are using is that we, in the origin system, for example, in the approval system, when we record that, hey, OK, this payment is now approved, at the same time, we record a message to the local database inside the same transaction. So if the uh, approval gets committed to the database, also the uh, message gets committed to the database. Then on commit, using Django's on commit, you can find more about it in the documentation, we send the message. So only after it has been committed to the database, we send the message to the next system. The idea over here is that if you send the message before it's committed to the system, you can have the uh, hardest to debug fail case. So you, for example, if you have the customer verifying a payment, you uh, first record that inside the transaction to the database, uh, then you send the message about that, and then for some reason the transaction doesn't get committed. You have a message over in the core accounting that, okay, customer sent 100 euros of money out of the account, 
but in the origin system you see nothing about that. You might have something in the logs, but you have this phantom message, you don't know, see anything in the database. And it's really hard to debug these cases. So use on commit if you are doing messaging, uh, because in the other direction it's quite reliable, but when you get the error case, it's uh, really hard to debug. Okay, now, on commit is not guaranteed to run, or you can have some errors. Actually, we are using on commit, we are actually in Hallway, we are creating an asynchronous task, which we then execute, uh, because on commit you don't want to run anything heavy. But you can kind of do lightweight HTTP request, for example, in the on commit. But it might fail, you might have a network error, you might have a, the other system might be down, it might be overloaded. So if you get a batch of payments in, 1,000 payments coming in, and you fire as fast as you can to the other system, it will get overloaded. Uh, and then you need to retry. So the idea is that only on commit you uh, send a message from the local database, then you retry if it doesn't go first through. Finally, on the receiving side, when you are retrying, you need to deduplicate, so you get this uh, idempotency setup where basically the semantics are exactly ones. This way we have reliable mes messaging. This works. I have also been talking with um, some consultants from other companies, and they are using for banking, and they are using something very much like this. So it's it's a proven system. It's some some might say that it's a maybe a bit heavyweight, but it's it's really reliable. Okay, now you can abstract this model. You can have this inbox outbox model. So in the origin system, you have the outbox where you record the messages. Basically, you have an ID, you have uh, the payload, you have a couple of timestamps when the message was created, when was, when was it processed or sent uh, out from the system. Uh, then you do the on comment send and so on. On receiving side, all of the messages from the outbox of the other system, you store them in an inbox. And you should have a unique constraint on the inbox so that the origin's ID, you don't process the same message multiple times. So doing a deep deduplication by having a PostgreSQL unique constraint. Or, well, database unique constraint. It doesn't need to be PostgreSQL. Finally, you do reconciliation checks with the inbox and outbox. You check, okay, in the last hour, how many messages did I send from system A, how many messages do I have in the outbox, and in the uh, receiving system you said, check, okay, how many messages there are in the inbox. Do, do the uh, counts match? If they don't, you can react fast. Also, you can easily, if, if some message is lost somewhere, even with this setup, you can, from the outbox, you can just have an admin view and click some message that, okay, resend this. Okay, how do you actually transport the messages? For reliability, it turns out it's not important. Uh, you can use HTTP with REST. So now, now the simple setup is that you have one origin system, you have one receiver system, and you send the messages just using the standard uh, requests library and then REST framework on the other side. It works pretty well. Of course, you can have these cases where you uh, overload the other system, but it's fine. You have this retrying logic, so it will be eventually sent over to the other system. But if you want to do, for example, this uh, pop sub type of thing. Uh, it's really nice to use something in between that does the uh, pub-sub. So you, from the origin, you still have the outbox. From the outbox, on commit, you send to Kafka. Kafka does its thing. Uh, it can uh, do things like check which uh, receivers are allowed to see which messages. You kind of get the rate limiting because the receivers can play the log as fast as they can, but if they fall behind, it's fine. They can just keep on doing their stuff until they catch up. And of course, the receivers over here, they can be different systems. And uh, so, so you get through pub sub, so you can do stuff like, okay, I got a payment in, at the same time, send a push notification to the customer, at the same time, try to do some machine learning 
uh, use some machine learning based approach on the uh, categorization so we can check that, okay, how to push this message to bookkeeping and so on. So you can, you can do the through PubSub with Kafka. So the transport using Kafka is important or it's very useful when you are trying to get these benefits, but it's not actually that important for reliability. And finally, of course, you have the outbox inbox model over here still, so you can do the reconciliation of, okay, have these messages actually been sent? So this was mostly about uh, uh, reliability considerations uh, of messaging. So now you have a messaging setup that works really well. It turns out, as you very likely know, that the most likely reason for error is that somebody makes a, a programming mistake. So what we are doing is that we have this, uh, of course, we are, we are using pretty standard uh, practices for developing our software. So we have this desk dri uh, driven development uh, approach. We write tests, we have continuous integrations, we do reviews in GitHub, so everything that goes in, it's actually from compliance point of view also important that you review the uh, code, so everything needs to be checked by somebody else. We react quickly to failures, so uh, this is actually pretty important from the customer's point of view that if a payment is delayed for a couple of hours, it's it's fine if we react to it. If the customer needs to call us, you have a problem in a, uh, kind of this uh, customer uh, trust in Holovi. And of course, you get to do a lot of more work because then you need to do the customer communications that, okay, yes, this payment was, uh, was lost. We, we fixed it by doing something and now it's fine. So it costs you a lot of money. Always fix the original reason. So if you find that, hey, something strange is happening, try to find out what's the original reason. Do, do not just uh, check that, okay, I made the payment now, go through, I just clicked somewhere that, okay, retry this. But try to find out what's, what's wrong in the system because when you are scaling up, you want to get uh, more and more reliability. Otherwise, it's going to be really, really painful if you go for the enterprise level. And we are using monitoring and reconciliation. I said a bit about the reconciliation of the inbox outbox model, but there is also reconciliation you can do on kind of a business logical level. So you check in one system that how much money you have moved out. You check in the in other systems that do they match the, the do the amounts match. If you do this constantly, you'll quickly see the cases where you have these uh, error cases and you can fix them quickly without needing to wait for customers to call you. In many cases it happens actually if the customers call you, it takes a lot of time to react because uh, I have seen a couple of cases where it has taken more than a week than when you get the initial call that hey something is broken, we, we lose one payment in 10,000 say. Uh, something is broken and then you uh, let it run for a while and you lose more payments and then it gets really painful to fix the data. The uh, kind of the data is already in the accounting of the f uh, company and you need to somehow then fix past data which is something you, you really don't want to change the account statement of your uh, bank account or the payment account. If you need to do that, uh, it's going to cost you a lot in customer trust. Uh, for monitoring, we are also using Datadoc, so on the infrastructure layer, that works really well for us. So we get, uh, and Sentry also, so we get a bit uh, nice alerts when we have these error cases. Usually you actually want to check this error rate instead of individual errors when you have a bit more volume, because it's, it's kind of uh, assumed that some of the cases are going to fail once and then you retry and then they go through. Okay, that was pretty much it. Uh, one thing I could say a bit more about is this sophistication. So what I said in the startup slide is that when you have a small system, you don't need to have this reliability yet built in. But if you aim to scale, 
or if you are now scaling, you will face this problem at some point. If you have these messages, if you are working with money, you can't uh, lose. If you are working with messages, you can't lose. So in that case, I really uh, would recommend that you use this, this kind of setup where you have absolute reliability on the messaging setup. So that was it. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers. This has been a really nice example of how to set up a kind of uh, inclusive, professional, well-organized event while still keeping it relaxed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ansi. We got some time for questions before we go into lunch. Um, so, about the inbox outbox model, uh, can you talk a little bit about that in the sense of um, are there two completely database clusters also? Are the systems separated for security reasons? Because you could as well just have the inbox and outbox model in one database or even in the same table to do the reconciliation. Uh, if you have these two different systems, of course, then you have need to have them in two different uh, databases also. If you are using two different databases. I'd, we are actually doing, we have kind of a large monolith code base right now, but we are doing messaging from the same code base back to the same code base. So uh, even in that setup, uh, it's good to have this inbox, different model, outbox, different model, where you can, the outbox records a bit different data, so in the out outbox you record that, okay, the uh, inbox message ID was this. I received it at this, to this time. The inbox uh, origin, well, kind of inbox create time was this. In the outbox, you record basically just the data and when you sent it, when you created it. So then you can reconciliate on the create time of the outbox and inbox. And even if you are using it in inside one, uh, one system, one code base, I'd go for two different database models just for the reason of, uh, if you want at some point split it up, then it's easy to do. Also, when you are a small company, I'd, I'd go not, not go for microsystems, but have one large code base, but have these messaging approaches, even if you are using a bigger, uh, bigger code base, so that when you scale, you can split it up if you need to. Do we have more questions? There's one. To the microphone. Uh, hey, I was wondering whether you considered, instead of this inbox and outbox model, to use only append only data structures and keeping pointers and basically following, following the logs from one and copying to the other one. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm asking this, this because I'm involved with a project. We do 100 million messages per day, and it's not OK to lose a single one. And it's not really hard to do if you em emulate the patterns of how Kafka does it internally, yeah. also in, in your own databases? You could, depending on the case, you could, you could use Kafka directly. So, so instead of recording anything in the database, you first record the message and then you process it in the database. So you go kind of moving from Kafka as a transport for messages, you move for uh, Kafka as the data storage of the messages. So that's one way. Then you use Kafka for these uh, pointers and stuff like that. You could also do that in the database. I'm, I haven't considered how to do that, so not, not sure how, how it would work. The idea over here is that you would use the uh, outbox model and send it to Kafka. So if you want this 100, me 100 million messages per day, so you get it reliability, uh, reliably to Kafka. And then you can use Kafka for the kind of having the pointers and doing the replays and stuff like that. Yeah. M my question was because the outbox introduces a mutable intermediate storage, it introduces also the chance to lose the message. Uh, it's append only, the outbox. Ah, okay, clear. So, so or, well, you will de delete after 30 days. So you just insert new messages over there. And the only update you do is that, okay, now this has been pushed to somewhere. But that's the only update. Okay, are there more questions? Going once, 
going twice. Thank you, Ansi. Thank you.